continue our series through the book of Proverbs. And we're looking at the next batch of scriptures today. And that is from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 7 to 19. And we've titled this one, The Beginning of Wisdom. Last week was To Know Wisdom. This one is The Beginning of Wisdom. The beginning of Wisdom is actually taken from Proverbs 9, 10. Nevertheless, my question to the audience is, today is, what is the proverb of Proverbs? We know from 1 Kings chapter 4, 32, that Solomon wrote 1,005 songs, and the Song of Songs in the Bible is the Song of Songs of those 1,005. And he also wrote 3,000 Proverbs, that passage tells us. And 800 of those Proverbs are recorded for us in the book of Proverbs. So my question to you, what is the proverb of Proverbs? I asked someone during the week, and they said to me, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In fact, it also tells us in Proverbs 1.7, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And... But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So to them it was the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. Now the passage of scripture is Proverbs 3, 5 where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on, on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. And I think each of us can possibly have our own favorite proverb or proverb of Proverbs. But I believe that the proverb of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs is the last verse from last week. Verse 6, where it says, To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. To understand the proverb because if the Pharisees and Sadducees were able to understand a proverb, then they would have been able to understand when Jesus came on the scene, Matthew 13 particularly, and gave those parables, they would be able to understand them. And Jesus' disciples only understood them because Jesus interpreted them for them. So that is the key thing. What we pray for is that we will be able to understand the words of the wise and the dark sayings and the interpretation of a proverb. So I believe the answer is Proverbs 1, 6. Nevertheless, looking at this passage from verse 7, it says there, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. As I mentioned in Proverbs 9, 10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise the wisdom and instruction. Now, when you're looking at the instruction from verses 3 and 4 of Proverbs 1, it mentions seven, which I've written out here for you. Seven instructions. And you'll notice that the fear of the Lord is foundational for wisdom and knowledge. And... Understanding is not here because having these things is the culmination of understanding. It says to us in um, the Bible, yeah, if I could just pick up from verse, um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and of wisdom. Just to give you a scripture from Jeremiah 9.23, it says, Be not, glorify not, if you are wise, glorify not in your wisdom. It says, if you are mighty, glorify not in your might. And if you are rich, glorify not in your richness. But glorify in this, Jeremiah 9.23, that you understand and know me. So the ultimate, not to glorify in your wisdom or glorify in your might, 
or your riches. But the ultimate glorifying that you should be doing is that you understand and you know God. If we look at Proverbs 9.10, all three of these things are mentioned, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Where it says in Proverbs 9.10, it says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy or Holy One, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So once you know God as your Lord and Savior, that with that is accredited to you, accounted to you as understanding. Paul in Philippians 4 10 said this. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable even unto his death that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead which is the end result of the gospel it's the culmination of the gospel he says brethren I count myself not to have apprehended but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth for those things which are before I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So this high calling, this to know Him, that I may know Him, this understanding that comes with us, is knowing that Jesus Christ is the high calling of God. So, glorifying that, it tells us. Furthermore, if we look at the fools, it says here, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In Proverbs 14, 6, it says, The scorner seeketh wisdom, but doesn't find it. But knowledge is easy to those that understand. In fact, this particular scripture goes in tandem. If you look at verse 28, which we'll touch on next week, where it says, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. And this is wisdom speaking. Because the scorner has essentially despised wisdom. So that when he comes to try and find wisdom, he can't search her out, he can't seek her. Remember the foolish virgins with oil in their lamp and they had to go and buy oil Proverbs 23 23 says buy truth and sell it not and wisdom and instruction so we need to accumulate those things remember we had mentioned to you the definitions briefly on wisdom was the accumulation of facts and sorry Knowledge was the accumulation of facts. Wisdom was the application of facts. Understanding was the assortment of facts. And the other one I want to give you today is subtlety. And subtlety is essentially the accuracy. So we've been instructed, we have these seven instructions to operate the Word of God in these areas. To, that's our application. That's our accumulation. So subtlety is the accuracy. So how you handle your craft or your skill is your subtlety, to be subtle. And Paul, by trade, in the natural world, was a tent maker. And he used to work with the thick camel hide, which was difficult to work with. You had to measure twice, cut once. It was expensive. So they were skilled. Paul was skilled in how to work and make tents out of these camel hides. He had to be accurate. He had to rightly divide 
the camel hide, as he tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15. So, as he was in the spiritual, doing spiritual studies, if you like, studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As he is studying God's word and rightly dividing the word of God, knowing what is for time past and for time future, knowing what is for Israel and what is for the body of Christ, knowing these things, so too he was skillful working and he was accurate in his trade. So likewise, we need to be accurate with the Word of God. I mentioned last week, I'll say it again, there's many people I know that know the Word of God. There's many people that I know that are wise in the Word of God. But there are not many that I know that accurately, subtly, rightly divide the Word of God. And I'm talking about aged men. I'm talking about educated men. I'm talking about people that have gone to Bible institutions because they don't get this in Bible institutions. They don't teach you there how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. So, it tells us here in verse 8, it says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father. So the instruction, these are the seven instructions of thy father. My son, thy father. We touched on that last week. My son, who is my son? Israel, who is my father? God the Father. Jesus Christ taught him how to pray. Our father. My son, we touched on two scriptures last week. It was from Exodus 4.22. My son, my firstborn. Then he tells Pharaoh, God the Father, and so too in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, he says, Out of Egypt I've called my son. So my son here is essentially Israel that God the Father is speaking to. And in fact, the words of the book of Proverbs, these 800 Proverbs accumulated together, essentially, doctrinally speaking, are looking towards the last days. So it's preparing Israel. Israel for the last days. Excuse me. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Now, the mother part here, now, the instruction, the law, the same things, essentially. But the mother part here is wisdom. Now, when we get into next week, we'll look at wisdom. And it tells us in verse 20, for instance, just to show you the mother part, it says, Wisdom crieth without she uttereth her voice wisdom she her in the streets she crieth verse 21 in the chief place of concourse in the openings of the gates in the city she uttereth her words saying so wisdom her pronoun is feminine and she's portrayed essentially if you when you get to Proverbs 31 the virtuous woman wisdom is epitomized as the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 at the culmination, at the end of the book of Proverbs. So you have something tangible that you can see how wisdom is portrayed. It tells us here that Paul, I'm just mentioned to you on Paul as well, on two occasions, in fact, he said to the church in Corinth, and the church in Thessalonica, for instance, this is Paul. Now, now Paul, he too, at one stage, told the church in Corinth that he espoused them as a bride. And a lot of people take that as a doctrine. But it's not a doctrine, it's a simile. He's saying, be as a bride. It's as a like. It's, it's simile. It's figure of speech. But unfortunately, people take that as doctrine and they think Paul is saying that the church is the bride of Christ. But nowhere in the Bible do you actually get the church is the bride of Christ. It's come out from ill doctrine, from sermons, from hymns. But nevertheless, here, if you look at 1 Corinthians 3, 2, it says, I have fed you with milk. So Paul is like a mother to the Corinth church, feeding them with milk. Remember? Milk and meat, I mentioned to you before, where the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are the milk books for Israel. And when you look at Hebrews to Revelation, those nine books, that's the meat for Israel. And here too with Corinth, in the beginning, remember when he mentions them as a child, 
Um, they spoke as a child, and Corinth was very much a child like. I've done a Bible talk where you see the growth, spiritual growth, from Romans as a babe all the way to maturity when it gets to the final book that Paul writes. But nevertheless, here you have um, a child, and Ephesians 4.14 also says, uh, We are no longer children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But here he says, I have fed you with milk in 1 Corinthians 3.2. And in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, he says, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So Paul portrays himself as a nurse. It's like he takes on this role as a caring mother for the churches of Corinth and Thessalonica. So he's not saying he is their mother, <laughs> but he's like a mother. He's as a mother, uh, feeding them milk and cherishing them as a nurse. So... If you look at verse 9, it goes on and says, For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Now, these seven instructions should, although these are essentially intangible, you can't touch them, they should be portrayed about your neck as jewelry. Peter picks up on this in 1 Peter chapter 3, 3, where he says that we are... Not to be adorned on the outside with hair, jewelry, and apparel, apparently. Now, Peter's writing specifically to the pilgrims and strangers during the time of Daniel's 70th week. We call the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. He's writing to the Jews during that period of time. And he's saying to them, don't adorn yourself with outward appearance hair, jewelry, apparel. He says, but adorn yourself, 1 Peter chapter 3, 4, with the hidden man with ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So we need to be adorned with a meek and quiet spirit. We need to be adorned with wisdom and justice and judgment and equity, subtlety, knowledge, discretion, and having the accuracy and the Accumulation and the application of those things. However, in the next verse, it speaks about tangible things because it says here, verse 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. They enticing, sinners are enticing to go get tangible things, to go steal, steal and plunder and destroy. And they focusing on taking tangible things. So we Proverbs 1, my son, the father is speaking to the son and saying, focus on these things. Keep these things in your heart. Remember, it, we learned that scripture last week about having things hid in your heart. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Also in verse 10 it says, my son, if sinners entice, if sinners entice you, it's in contrast to verse 20 where it says, Wisdom crieth outside, wisdom crieth without. So as you have wisdom crying, calling the wise sons, those that are instructed in the way of the Lord, as wisdom is calling them, so you have on the contrary, you have sinners enticing them that they don't go to wisdom, but they follow the way of sin. More on the way in a moment when we get there, shortly. If they say, verse 11, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us look privately, privately, for the innocent without cause. This reminds us of Cain who killed Abel. Somebody once said, Cain wanted to be like his brother, but he wasn't Abel. But Cain killed Abel. He looked for that innocent blood. Joseph's brothers, Jacob's sons, they colluded together. They connived and conspired and they sought Joseph to the point that they took off his cloak of many colors and they killed a kid of the goats and they took that blood and they spoiled it upon the coat to show their Jacob that Joseph was dead. In fact, just to mention that Jacob 
had beguiled his father Isaac when he had told him that they had caught venison and in fact Rebekah had cooked meat of the kids of the goats. So Isaac was deceived with his taste. Isaac was deceived in all five senses. With his eyes, with his ears, he thought it was the voice of Jacob, and they said to him it was the voice of Esau. He felt his touch, his, his smell, uh, all five senses. Isaac was deceived. But the thing that he tasted, he thought he was eating venison, but he was actually eating the deceptive meat of a young kid. And likewise, Jacob is also deceived by that same animal, by his own sons, where they said a wild animal killed Joseph. Meanwhile, it was the blood of a kid. And what about Jesus? His brethren, so-called, connive together for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His own flesh and blood, where I say that, where the Israelites came together to seek His innocent blood. And there was no more innocent blood than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Verse 12, let us swallow them up alive as the grave. That reminds me of Korah and his rebellion, highlighted for us in Jude 11, which I may get to in a moment. But they rebelled against Moses. As Moses was the spokesman for Israel during the wilderness, so Paul is the spokesman for the body of Christ during our period of time. As people rebelled during the rebellion of Korah, during those wilderness days, so today people are rebelling against Paul. Because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. So the grave swallows them up and whole as those that go down into a pit. Some Bible characters went down into a pit. I'm reminded of Proverbs 24, 16, which says, The righteous man falls seven times, but rises up again. And Joseph went down into a pit. His brothers threw him into a pit. But by God's grace and divine planning, he rose out of that pit. Benaiah, one of Dad's, David's mighty men, he went to a pit on a snowy day and he slew a lion. He went down into a pit. And a reminder of Jeremiah that was cast in prison. He was in a well. He was in a pit at the time of the Babylonian siege. Those three, also Daniel cast into a lion's den, and Jonah was in the belly of a whale, and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in the belly of the earth. But the righteous, they may land up in a pit, or a dungeon, or a den, or a well, or the belly of a whale, or the belly of the earth, but they too shall rise again. We shall find all precious substance, and we shall fill our houses with spoil. Verse 13. Unlucky for some, the sin of Achan, who stole from the spoils of the battle of Jericho. He had sin in the camp. Be careful you don't have sin in your camp. And be like that of Achan, that brings curse upon himself and his family and his household. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. This is like a salt covenant. It will be ultimately the covenant with the Antichrist in Israel, where they will have one purse with him. One purse, a way of buying and selling the mark of the beast system during the 70th week of Daniel, as mentioned, the time of Jacob's trouble, David's, Daniel's week. And my son, walk not thou in thy way with them, refrain thy foot from thy path. Walk not thou in thy way. This is the first time way is mentioned in this passage of Scripture. It's mentioned 53 times in the book of Proverbs. And it's also mentioned 608 times in the King James Bible. It's the way ultimately Jesus Christ, Matthew 7, said there is a broad way and there is a narrow way. And here we find this way that is mentioned. And that is essentially what the book of Proverbs is about. It's the doc 
turn to Israel for the last days, how they should choose the right way. Um, I've had an edit issue on this camera while I was recording, so I'm not sure what I've said and what I haven't said. So forgive me if I repeat and regurgitate myself this last stretch. So ultimately, the narrow way leads you to the celestial city. John Bunyan's book that he wrote, Pilgrim's Progress, about Christian on the straight and narrow. And as long as he was on the straight and narrow, the lines that were chained couldn't get to him. He was out of reach, out of distance. But if he veered off and diverted off that path, then he could be subject to them. Remember, the lion, the devil himself, goes about like a roaring lion, so you can devour. So you're going to walk on that straight and narrow. Don't be like Achan. Don't be like Korah, or Cain, or Balaam. And the straight and narrow leads you to the celestial city, which is the new heavenly Jerusalem, which is adorned as a bride. And wisdom here is portrayed as a woman, epitomized as the virtuous woman. Whereas, contrary to that, you have the harlot. So you have the virtuous woman, you have the harlot, Revelation 17. You've got Mystery Babylon, Revelation 18, contrary that to that of the heavenly Jerusalem. So, if you walk the broad path, it'll take you to the harlot and Babylon. The narrow path will take you to the celestial city. For their feet... Oh, uh, refrain thy foot from the path. As I mentioned in Scripture earlier, Proverbs 10, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. So as the Lord directs our path, we mustn't be like them, where they, thy path, thy foot from their path. In verse 15, don't follow their path, their way. For their feet run to evil, and make haste to shed blood. This we will touch on when we get to Proverbs chapter 6, when it speaks about the seven deadly sins. Those are two of them. Verse 17, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. The net is the parable of the net that goes out to bring in the fish. Remember the clean and the unclean fish. But they choose not to be part of the net. The Lord sends the gospel out to bring in. He said to Peter, I shall make you fishers of men. You send out the net, bring in the fish. But they choose not to be part of the net of the great heavenly capture. And they lay wait for their own blood. Verse 18. They look privily for their own lives. I'm reminded of Haman and Absalom. Um, for instance, Haman built a gallows for Mordecai in the book of Esther. But he himself hung on his own gallows. Absalom went to go sort his own kingdom, his own way, his own things. But his demise was caught up in the bow of an oak tree of which he hung between heaven and earth. More knows in a moment as we close here. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy for gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. I'm reminded of Balaam in Jude 11. It tells us that he was greedy for gain. It says, beware they have gone the way of Cain. It speaks about the rebellion of Korah, Jude 11. And also it speaks about the greedy gain of Balaam. And that's what happened with Israel during the 70th week of Daniel about the greedy gain. Instead of them choosing to follow the Lord and His instructions and keeping in the way of the narrow, they're going to take the path where they can buy and sell and live a life of luxury and opulence um, on this earth during that period of time. Anyone who's wealthy or rich during the period of time. Remember the Bible told us that we read it in Jeremiah, earlier Jeremiah 9.23, it says, He that is rich in not glory in his riches. But James warns, the epistle of James warns about those, Woe unto the rich man, because if you're rich during the tribulation, it means that you're tapped into the mark of the beast system. And then you've got to cut off your hand that offends you, so that you can enter into the kingdom. It tells us in Scripture. So, which take away the life of the owners thereof. So just to close with this, and that is, there's three people, Haman, 
and Absalom and Judas Iscariot, each of them hung. Mordecai hung on his own gallows. His gallows was built by wood. Absalom hung in the bow of an oak tree, wood. And Judas Iscariot hung. All of them hung between heaven and earth. The Bible tells us, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus Christ hung on a tree. Jesus Christ, the Peter says, Jesus Christ hung on the cross so that he took upon himself our curse so that we may be delivered and we may be set free. So here you two, you have these three that hung or hang on their own righteousness, not on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, their own righteousness between heaven and earth. So don't you be caught up like these guys, the Word of God tells us. Take the warning, take the instruction, follow these seven ways. These seven things will lead you to the path of understanding that you can know a proverb in the interpretation and the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. It tells us in um, Proverbs 14, 6, it says, The scorner will seek wisdom but will not find it, but knowledge comes easy to those that understand. If you rightly divide the word of truth, then understanding the scriptures will come easily to you. And almost, I want to say naturally, I'll probably have to use the word supernaturally to you. And the last scripture I want to close with would be that in Proverbs 9.10, where it says, And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy, or knowledge of the Holy One, bringeth understanding. To God be the glory in Jesus' name.